Sewer and Food Service Power Plant Network. Happy Monday night, everybody. I hope it's as beautiful right now wherever you are as it is here in Colorado. Sun is shining. It was 74 last time I checked, and uh, someone's walking their dog right outside my house right now. Welcome to the Food Service Power Plant Show. Gosh, it's good to be with you. I hope it was a great weekend for you. Whatever you celebrate, time with family or time to rest, whatever you needed most. Uh, tonight, we have a special guest. Farmer Lee Jones is joining us. Of course, all of these conversations, we bring on industry leaders where we talk life, we talk success, we talk challenge, we talk mental health, all the things that it looks like to be human. And we bring on industry leaders who share with us their stories and their experiences. Farmer Lee Jones is one of the most well-known we've ever had. You know, I met Farmer Lee, I think back in December, Farmer Farmer Lee was in Boulder, where I live, and we got to connect for a little bit. I asked if he'd be willing to have a cup of coffee, and uh, it was a total gift to talk about regenerative farming, to talk about mental health, to talk about so many things, all the ways he gets to contribute in the industry. Uh, apparently, a couple weeks ago, he was at the United Nations. He's got a book. He's on television shows. Farmer Lee, of course, in Huron, Ohio, has the Chef's Garden where anyone can come. They can get uh, veggies. A, a lot of our most well-known chefs fly out there and work with Farmer Lee to get the best veggies and then work with their Culinary Vegetable Institute. He and, and Jamie Simpson to learn how to cultivate those and harness those, et cetera. We're going to talk more about that. Um, and it's going to be a really fun night. Dean's here. Yo, Dean. Josh is here. Hi, Josh. Ekta is here. Hello, Ekta. It's great to see you. Listen, uh, a couple notes before I bring the man, the myth on. Um, you might, I might encourage you to grab a pen and a notepad. There will probably be things he has to share, parts of his story that might be beneficial for yours. And don't miss those. Take a, take a note, write them down, and you might just think about them as you're waking up tomorrow morning and starting a new day. The other thing is you're welcome to comment. You're welcome to ask questions like my friend Josh right here is doing so. If you've got a question for Farmerly, throw it in. Um, lastly, uh, a big thank you to the people that helped make this possible, the team at Zumba Group. Food Service, Equipment and Supplies Magazine, Restaurant Development and Design. Thanks for believing in this mission of spreading positive positivity and connection. And the team at Crave and Company who built our website. If you haven't seen it, all of our conversations are there amongst with a bunch of other resources on personal growth, mental health. Go check it out, fspowerplant.com. Let's go find the man, Farmer Lee Jones. Hi, hey. my friend. Hey, good evening. How are you? Just exactly right. Just exactly right. Was there a period in your life, Farmer Lee, that you that someone either said that to you and you're like, you know what, that fits, or that you came up with that or thought about that? Do you remember? Uh, I've said it for as long as I can remember. My father would always say it, or he would say, "Just great." No matter <laughs> what what was happening, he could have had a foot cut off, and somebody would have asked him how he was doing. Be just great. So. <laughs> That is amazing. Um, what a great mindset to walk into the day with. And when you say, I'm just exactly right, I, I don't know. What does that mean to you, Farmer Lee? It means just exactly right. Uh, you know, um, I think that sometimes, particularly when you have team members, the, the attitude can be they will come in and tell you something that maybe is going to be discouraging or yeah. uh, maybe going to throw you off your game. And I think that, you know, in farming, like anything else, weather can certainly be a factor. Lots of things can be a factor to things not going exactly as planned. And I think that for us, it's uh, it means it's an opportunity to rethink it, relook at it, maybe to spin it in a different way, and maybe it's going to be better than the other way that we had planned. So um, it's not a it's not a problem. It's an opportunity. I, I love that perspective. And when you lead that way in conversations with team members, it, it helps them think that way too. It really does change the way yeah. they approach any challenge. For those watching who don't know about the Chef's Garden or the Culinary Vegetable Institute, can you fill us in a little bit on, on what you do in both those places and how they sort of work together? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, the, the Chef's Garden is a family farm. It's family first and um, it's blood family, but it's extended family. And there's 187 families that are committed here on the farm every day to growing the most nutritious, healthiest, sexiest vegetables in the world. And that's our goal. And uh, we've been working directly with chefs for 40 years. Um, we had a change of uh, direction and change of life 40 years ago that sent us this direction. Mm -hmm. And, uh, my dad had an idea of building a place because 
we felt like the symbiotic relationship between chef and farmer was so much stronger than a farmer or farmers working on their own and chefs working on their own. And so we had started bringing chefs in and we would put them up in a, a, a bed and breakfast or in a hotel and get them to the farm and we'd get in the field and we'd learn together. And my dad scratched out on a paper bag, literally, an idea of building a facility called the Culinary Vegetable Institute, which would be a place where chefs could stay overnight, bring their culinary teams, come into the fields with us, get on our hands and knees, look at product, bring it back in the kitchen, um, have chefs in the kitchen uh, of our own that understand our vegetables and then work with them, not necessarily for our chefs to teach visiting chefs because those chefs are brilliant in their own right, but just really uh, kind of facilitating and having an open mind. And Chef Jamie Simpson has been with us now 10 years and he's absolutely brilliant and just has this why not attitude of looking at a plant in an entirely different way than ever considered before. And one of the things we've learned from chefs is that at every single stage of a plant's life, it offers something unique to the plate. And of course, one of Chef Jamie's passions and ours is reducing waste. And so he's always looking at that plant and saying, is there a part of the plant that we could use that we normally throw away? And so it's really exciting to see what we can create with some of those um, additional parts of the plant. Wow. Um, I, I love your dad's vision and recognizing how closely linked the farm is, of course, to the chef and the ingenuity to bring people in, have that forethought. Let's house them. Let's put them up bed and breakfast, get them to the farm. I think it's, uh, I mean, just brilliant. And clearly it's done so many wonderful things, spreading positive messages around sustainability, around healthy vegetables, et cetera. Good evening, Rio. How are you, brother? Good to see you. Um, farmer Lee, share with us quickly. How did you become a farmer? How, how did this get into who you are? Following in my father's footsteps. Um, if, you know, um, we did we did everything early um, from growing to harvesting, to packing, to delivering, to starting over the next day from my mother sending me with my father at the, you know, you'd start at daylight, you'd harvest product, you'd bring it in, you'd pack it and load it on a truck and then head into farmer's markets. Farmer's markets that are entirely different than what we think of today, where you go to the market at 7 a.m. or 8 a.m. Farmer's markets were farmer's markets that you went in at about midnight and you met grocery store buyers. You know, there were just like family-owned grocery stores. There were hundreds of them. Well, there were also um, family-owned farms and hundreds of those farms. And they would go in and... Um, the family-owned grocery stores would buy from directly from the farmers. And so you would go in and take your product in, you would sell it, and then you'd come back and then start over again the next day. It was called truck farming. Hmm. But my mom would send me along to keep my dad awake. And I can remember at seven, eight, nine years old, literally they just pounding on my dad's shoulder because he'd be nodding off with a load. I mean, it was scary times. But yeah. anything that I got to do with my dad, I wanted to do. And uh, he started at 14 working for a very progressive vegetable grower and um, ultimately ended up buying that farm from him in the 60s and ended up losing it in the early 80s. And that was when we had our opportunity to kind of rethink what we were doing and start over. Wow. Talk um, a little bit. I, th I think it's later, but we'll talk about it now. You talk about losing the farm. You know, you mentioned at the very beginning um, talking about changing perspective around challenge. And yeah, it can right. be opportunity and we can take this moment as hard as it might feel and become something even better than what we've been up till now. Um, you know, one of the things, questions we ask is about, is about challenge and overcoming. It teaches us what we're made of. Talk about that moment where you lost the farm and, and what you all learned about yourselves and, and really how that cultivated the next level of what the chef's garden could be. Yeah. I mean, I saw my parents just work really, really hard. Um, and when I was 19 years old, I stood shoulder to shoulder with my mother and father, my brother and sister, all of our neighbors, all of our competitors, everybody that was there to celebrate our failure. And they auctioned off every tractor, every piece of equipment, my mother's car and our house. Mm -hmm. And uh, they auctioned that off. I mean, it was a gut sickening feeling at 19 to see my parents work as hard as they had. And literally everything was gone. And... Uh, you know, we never paused. My mother said, okay, this is your opportunity to go do something 
new and go do what you want. And there was never any question we were going to farm again. We weren't sure how we were going to do that. We started back at farmers markets because it was instant cash. We could plant something in the ground and we could convert it to dollars pretty quickly. But it was very early on that we met a chef and we knew nothing about chefs. And this lady came, she had trained in Europe, she had a white jacket on, and she was looking for zucchini blooms. And she was looking for product that was grown naturally rather than chemically and looking for flavor rather than tons per acre. And, you know, she said, if you'll grow for the quality rather than the tons per acre, I believe that there would be enough chefs that would be willing to support you. Wow. And we were so desperate for a way to be able to survive in agriculture. And it really resonated with that. And we latched around this lady's ankles and we wouldn't let go. We said, teach us. <laughs> sure. And uh, we finished the season and we had said, look, we'd like to buy an hour of your time. And she was a, a chef for a brokerage firm in downtown Cleveland. Hmm. And she had kind of a nice situation. There would be investors in one day and she'd cook for them. Other days there wouldn't be anybody in and she would research and she'd play and she'd seek out good ingredients. And that's where she met us. And so we said, can we buy an hour of your time? Fortunately, she didn't charge us because we probably couldn't have afforded her. And we loaded in an old pickup truck and we went in and big, huge corporate uh, law office-like place. And uh, the, the table was covered with books, earmarked with different ideas of things that she had and was excited that somebody was listening because she had talked to other farmers and nobody was listening because it was so extreme. I think that like all of us, change is difficult. Um, unless you're really forced to change, sometimes those changes come slowly. But we were desperate for a way to be able to survive in agriculture. And it appeared like a path. It appeared like there was a niche there unfulfilled to grow for the quality, grow it without the chemical, do it for the flavor, do it for the flavor, do it for the flavor. That we heard repeatedly from chefs because we started growing for her and then she introduced us to another chef and then another chef. And early on, we met Jean-Louis Paladin from the Watergate Hotel in DC. And he was all about the quality and the flavor. And he was pretty gregarious and pretty bold about his statements of the way that we're growing food in the United States is not acceptable. And I'm softening that up very much. If any of you ever had any <laughs> um, acquaintance with Jean-Louis, he, he spoke his mind pretty thoroughly. And we appreciated that. Yeah. Um, the, but uh, we listened. And we learned, and he turned us on to, of course, a lot of European chefs that had come to America. A lot of Ritz-Carlton chefs were European influenced. And so it just really kind of resonated, and they were mentors to us. And we started to get the idea of what this was about. And so then we started pushing the chefs with, what about this? What about this? What about this? What sure. about this? And so it's been an exciting journey. That's amazing, Farmer Lee. Um, your, I've got a question from someone here in a minute. I've got your business card right here. This is your business card, the front yeah. of it, and it matches your tie. Uh, you, you've got this outfit, not outfit. This is your, these are your clothes. They, everywhere, everywhere. You, it must make waking up in the morning easy, uh, easier. You don't have to decide what you're pulling off the hanger. Um, how many pair? How many of those overalls and bow ties? Is that a tie? Do you tie it or is it a clip? Yep. I get asked that a lot. It's actually hand tied, but I'm not very good at it. I buy the material one place. I send it to this company that ties them and Love it is, and then I clip it. So I have 18 pairs of overalls, 18 white shirts, 18 red bow ties. There's no magical number about that, but uh, that just seems to work. There's one, there's one pair in the dirty clothes right now. I've got a pair on and there's 16 pairs hanging. <laughs> so now I always jokingly say this, Albert Einstein, also wore the same thing uh, every day. Unfortunately, that's where the similarities with him and I stop. <laughs> <laughs> that is great. Oh, I love it. Um, where did that come? It was it one day you woke up and you thought, you know what? This is just who I am. It's who it's where I feel most comfortable. It's who I want to be. It's how I want to represent the farm. Like when when did that moment come for you? Yeah, you know, not soon enough. I was kind of searching for an identity that would resonate. Um, I had read a book called uh, The Grapes of Wrath, uh, John Steinbeck. And uh, if anybody has really, you know, got a rainy day or need, they're sick or staying at home and they want to watch a good old Netflix, The Grapes of Wrath is a black and white um, 
and Henry Fonda, if listeners know who he was, um, was like 21 or 22 years old in this movie. So it's a long time ago. And he was the main character in it. But to set it up, the Dust Bowl, the Great Depression, mm -hmm. a lot of farms were displaced. Um, banks repossessed their farms. And a lot of times they would load all of their belongings on one old farm truck. And it might have the plow. And they might have a goat or a cow on there and three generations and the dog and everything that they had managed to survive or or to save when they left when they were thrown off the farms but there were large organization large farms corporate farms that would uh, put the word out that there was work and there were thousands of these displaced farmers and when the word would get out hundreds of people would get there, try and get there to work because all they wanted to do was to have a job and to earn a living. And uh, they were really taken advantage of by these large ranches or farms or orchards where they would get hundreds, literally hundreds of families that would show up. They would pay them a dollar and a half or two dollars a day. They would charge them to stay in the camp and charge them for a hot meal and a shower. By the time the day was over, they damn near owed the orchard to be able to work there for the day. Wow. But um, there's a scene on a Saturday night and despite how hard trodden they were and how bad and despaired things were, uh, the farmers put on their overalls. They were torn, they were worn, but they were clean. And they had a square dance. They had overalls and they had white shirts and they had a bow tie. And you know, it was one of the few books in high school that I read, and it always resonated with me. And I never realized that just a handful of years later, we would experience a very near, nearly similar situation. Mm -hmm. And it's for everybody that ever wanted to farm, everybody that ever lost a farm, everybody that went to anybody that ever went to a grandparent's farm and remember it, anybody that ever dreamed about being a farmer. It's to represent small farms throughout America. Um, my dad always would invest in the best equipment on the farm, but he always thought a vehicle was a poor investment. So we would drive these really rough cars. And if we missed the school bus and my parents would take us to school, we would ask our parents to drop us off a block before school because we were embarrassed of the vehicles that our parents drove. Mm. And at some point early on, I just realized that, and there's an old farm saying, you can't make a silk purse from a sow's ear. It's okay to be okay in your own skin. And I kind of thrive on pulling into a Ritz Carlton and uh, in an old pickup truck that's muddy and get out in my overalls and let them valet park it. And I, you just hit a point where you're okay with who you are. And yeah. so you go as you are and represent. Beautiful. Holy smokes, Farmer Lee. It's such a personal, what you wear is so personal, the reasons why. And I love that you, you know, I think it's a, one of the greatest questions or opportunities for so many people is when am I going to feel comfortable in my own skin? Right. right as I am, the person I am, there's this fine balance. I think oftentimes I, I'll say that I walk personally, I think many between person I'm always longing to become. There's always a dream. There's always something to hope for. That's what makes it fun. And being satisfied and comfortable in my own skin right where I am and holding those two together. And I love your ability to uh, to, 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 to do that, to, to get to be that. Um, heck yeah, someone's saying. I love it. I love it. I love it. Here's a question from our buddy, um, Chef Travis. I got to meet Chef Travis back in November, December down Arizona. He's got a great background. And when I posted that I was talking with you, Travis was so excited. Here's a great question. What's the hardest vegetable to logistically deliver to the markets and restaurants and why? Great question, Travis. Yeah, um, it comes to mind very quickly. And I've had chefs beg me to ship them and we've told them it doesn't ship good. And we say it doesn't. it's not going to travel well. And they beg us to ship it. And it's the Frey du Bois. Now that's probably doesn't fit in the classification of a vegetable, but it's a it's a uh, it's a French variety of strawberry. They're about the size of your pinky fingernail, and 
the aroma and the bouquet and the fragrance of that strawberry would seduce any human being. They're just that amazing and the flavor on them, but they don't ship. Um, so we should pick them, package them, do our best to ship them. And we get the phone call from the chef and say, oh, they're all molded. And we're like, yeah, well, we told you that was going to happen. But <laughs> so it's, uh, it's one of those, if we could figure out how to ship those, it would be amazing. When are those in season? When do they grow, Farmer Lee? Yeah, June. June, okay. June. And and you can harvest from those and, you know, they'll grow in the wild, but uh, they're popular in France, and but they can't be grown here. So. After I'll go back just a little bit, I mean, to the overalls, I actually have a registered trademark with the U.S. Attorney General's office with the overalls, the white shirt, the red bow tie. So it's a. Um, no way. Yeah. That is yeah. awesome. Yeah. yeah. Not that that means anything, uh, but it's kind of fun for to talk about. So. You know, when I see you um, walk into restaurants. And I and I and you're fun about posting pictures of places you were. You're uh, with Chef Thomas Keller and team, I think, in yeah. New York, right? Recently, I happened to be in Napa while you were in New York. And every night, my daughter and I we go on these drives, and it was a good distance from where we were staying in Napa to get to Yountville. And we always would drive by the French Laundry. We didn't have reservations, but um, to see you with these chefs and their teams, and they're, they're, everyone wants to get a picture and everyone wants to learn. It's really so fun to see how much they learn from you, the presence I believe that you are to them. Um, you know, I know when you and I met, where do we meet? The St. Regis, I think, the hotel in Boulder. And right. um, there's just such a, maybe it is your ability, you just your comfort in your own skin. Just exactly who you are showing up wherever you go. This is me. Take her, leave me. And, you know, the good news is everybody takes you, not only takes you, but says, "Get let me get her a notepad. I want to learn. What, what, what do you got for me today, Farmer Lee? Um, yeah, you know, I don't ever feel like that. I don't, I never have that attitude of, well, here I am. I mean, I go in and I feel honored to get to go. Yeah. And I feel honored to get to meet the teams. And I go to, because I want to learn. And mm -hmm. um, I've never had an, I, I've never had an attitude of like, well, I'm here. Uh, it's just, I don't have that in my DNA. I'm very humble and I'm very honored to get to be a small part of the culinary world and very, very gracious for the mentorship that chefs throughout the world have given me personally and our family. And I, I could never repay. I'm so indebted to so many chefs with big names and without big names. I'm just grateful that I've been allowed to remain in farming and for our family to be able to remain in farming. So I think it's just a symbiotic thing of a mutual respect. Um, but yeah, I've been in some pretty fancy uh, parties and the guys are in tuxedos and the women in evening gowns. And a guy will come up and whisper in my ear and say, God, you look so comfortable in those. I wish <laughs> I could pull that off. And like, <laughs> Just put them on. So, there you go. You can yeah. do it. Yeah. What about, um, you know, we're the product oftentimes of our habits or certain disciplines. Are there any disciplines in your life that you consistently practice or habits or things that you make sure your go-tos kind of daily to stay centered and keep growing and keep learning, et cetera? Yeah. I mean, I'm a, I try and get up the same time every day. Uh, I try and read the Bible. I like the New Testament. I try and read a chapter from the Bible every day. Whether you're a believer or non-believer, there's some pretty basic common sense in those about uh, doing well towards others and with integrity and honesty. And it's a it's the most widely read book in the world. And mm. I'm proud to say that I read that. But uh, consistency, really, I think consistency is important for me in my routine. Uh, try and get try and read something new all the time, but the consistency, whether I'm in New York or wherever I happen to be, or if I'm on the farm, the consistency is really critical for me. Uh, I agree. When I get into that routine, it's so helpful to maintain momentum. Uh, someone wants a hug. I don't know who wants a hug, but someone wants a hug. Farmer Lee's giving it to you. There you go. I love it. I love this guy. Someone says, heck yes. Um, Farmer Lee, when you're not as a farmer, my perception is farmers pretty much 
they farm a lot a, a, from morning when the sun rises till when the sun sets. It's such a significant part of every part of every day. But when you're not working, when you're not on the farm, when you're not working with your team, when you're not working with a team in a restaurant, what do you do? What are some of your go-tos to kind of fill your cup? Some of the things that bring you joy? Yeah, I mean, it's really, uh, I don't know if I can properly explain it. It's everything I do, I weave into who I am and what I do. Um, I have a team of Belgian draft horses. And that's one of the first things they do in the morning is go over and feed horses. But I like to integrate those. They're part, I love history. I love agricultural history. They're a part of our agricultural history. It wasn't so long ago that we were using horses on the farm. Um, I try and incorporate those in. If we have uh, um, a tour or something and I can work the horses in, I raise a few foals every year and try and generate some revenue from that. Um, you know, I've got some chickens, I've got some peacocks. Uh, um, it, it, it's just all, I, I try and weave, I, I hate to even call it work. I just, hmm. it's work life. It's the same for me. So I don't ever feel like I need to go on a vacation to get away from my life or from my work because I'm just, I'm living my dream. And it's just, it's my vacation every day. Do you work hard some days? You know, and that old cliche thing about if you love what you do, you never work a day in your life. Yeah, we work hard, but I love it. And it's uh, it's not something that I need to get away from. And I just, mm -hmm. every single thing that I do, I weave back to the farmer that I am and trying to be able to, I mean, we had a great conversation on the phone today with part of the 11 Madison Park team and just an exploration thing of we're going to try and do something in July and you know, we'll weave some of the things that I love to do into some of those events. And hmm. it's just, I don't know, it's hard to separate because it's just so blended together for me. That's such a gift. I, I haven't met a ton of people for whom that's their reality. Um, and I, rem I, I think finding people like you who just feel so alive, um, doing what they do throughout the day, whether you call it work, living, all of it. Um, it's such an inspiration. And, you know, I think there was, I, there was a quote today that I posted in, in the group um, about whatever you hope could be your reality, it is, go get it. And, you know, I think for anyone watching for whom you think, oh my gosh, I wish I could vacation all year or work kind of sucks the life out of me there. The opportunity exists. You're looking at them where you could live your dream, where there's a version of you coming alive that is you serving and you giving and you, we call it whatever we call work. And I think that's just such a gift and such an offer. Um, our buddy Travis, again, when I worked at Gramercy Tavern, we cooked for some huge names. My most memorable dishes I cooked were for the farmers that came in and we prepared them their produce. It brought tears to their eyes and still gives me chills to remember. Yeah. I, when I was on the phone today with 11 Madison Park, I had the opportunity a few months ago to go in. I didn't have a reservation, but I heard a little rumor that if you get there right at five o'clock, I think they open at 530, get there at five. There are six seats in the bar that you can get the full menu from 11 Madison Park from the bar. And so that's what I did because I didn't have a reso. I didn't want to make any big deal about coming and went in. And, and I told them today, I said, I was literally brought to tears by the purity of what they were doing with the vegetable. I, I'm a meat eater, not a vegetarian, but what they did to be able to bring the fullest potential out in those vegetables literally had brought me to tears. So I, I agree absolutely with the chef. And for us to be able to see, you know, we grow it in the field and we harvest it, we ship it off and to see the incredible craftsmanship and the skill and the creativity of what the chefs can do with that that food on the plate they bring it alive and it there's nothing more exciting um charlie trotter told us once that we we provide the paint for the artists and i always thought mm -hmm. that that was a kind of a cool way to do it i always think of chefs as more than an artist though craftsperson artist visionary and so it, it's hard to pinpoint them to an artist certainly an artist is part of that but it's so much more and so much more so much more depth to what they do. 
Uh, so well said, crafts person. You're right. There was a maybe it was your documentary. There's the there's that short documentary, uh, maybe eight minutes in length. I feel like I, I hope I'm getting that right. And in it, it maybe it was something else. But there's um, a part where I think you and Jamie are working on plating a table for people. And there are all these beautifully colored sauces, dots that I think Jamie's putting on a plate around a flower. There's a huge flower, yellow oh. at the top in the middle of it. Yeah. And yeah. I, I had never, when I saw that, and it was another level of me understanding who you all are and what you offer and what you do for chefs and so many people, I had never seen food done that way. I had never seen vegetables turned into something that truly looked like it could have been on a painting. It was just absolutely stunning. You're right. You are the paint for the for the painter, for the artist. Yeah, I think that, you know, Jamie and I are, we just were, I think we're poetry together. Um, but we have been deluged with marketing efforts to expect things or people or food to be or look a certain way that an apple has to be blemish free mm -hmm. or that a tomato can't have cat faces or cracks on it or that when it gets past a certain stage, then it's not marketable anymore. And one of the things that we've learned from chefs is that at every single stage of a plant's life, it offers something unique to the plate. Just because the radish has now shot a seed stalk out the top, doesn't mean that it's not marketable. Our mindset, I can remember the day we had a beautiful field of radishes on Friday. We had had 90 degrees for three days and it had all shot a seed stock. My brother was back plowing the field down. I didn't know he was plowing it over. I had a chef in, in the pickup truck with me and we were going back to look at the radishes. But that quickly, they can go from beautiful radish to seed stock. And in a farmer's mentality is that's no longer marketable. The chef saw my brother plowing this beautiful field of flowers over. He jumps out of the truck, it's still moving. He runs in front of the tractor, flags my brother down. Fortunately, my brother saw him and stopped the truck. And we all commenced to being on our knees in between the pickup truck and the tractor. And he, he starts tasting and looking at us. He's like, don't you realize what I can do with this on the plate? Wow. And, it, you know, Andrew Carmelini, who worked under Daniel Ballou at Cafe Ballou and now owns an empire of his own. He's on his hands and knees looking at the Carmelini being, or the, uh, Hercovert, and uh, it's a great French bean. Of course, you pick them when they're about six, seven inches long traditionally, and they're very thin. And uh, he's looking at the plant. He goes, I'm going to ask a stupid question. Of course, I didn't think it was stupid at all, but he says, could I get them this big instead of this big? He goes, I never really thought about the fact that they're only an inch and a half or that they're smaller before they get bigger. And I said, well, we could, but I don't know what we would call them. And he kind of reared back and he says, well, we're going to call him the Carmelini bean. And so, <laughs> so we trademarked them the uh, Carmelini bean. And then I I was selling them to Ducasse and Ducasse says, well, I really like them, but do we have to call him the Carmelini bean? And I'm like, yeah, that's their name. So <laughs> that's how we got there. That is really funny. Um, formerly, we, one of the things I think most about there's so many people who talk about sustainable farming and you talk about regenerative farming. And could you explain when you, when I heard you say that, I forget where it was. It blew my mind that you saw things that way. And it absolutely made sense. I think of it in a mental health perspective as well. Sometimes that, that sustainable, if my mental health is sustainable, well, that's getting by and that's good. Mm -hmm. But, it, but what's the next step towards waking up every morning ready to live your dream, you know, like to yeah. come alive and have energy, et cetera. Can you talk about that for you, regenerative versus sustainable farming and why you want to, or why you're so curiously insistent on being a regenerative farm? Well, I was never real good at pull-ups in gym class. <laughs> and I can remember hanging onto the bar and I thought, well, even if I can't do the pull-ups, if I can like hang on a little longer, at least it looks a little bit better. Yeah. You'd hang on until finally your fingers would slip away from the bar and you'd <laughs> drop to the ground. That's what I feel like sustainable is. It's like sustainability. It's hanging on. Where yeah. regenerative is, you know, you're rebuilding, you're regrowing, you're learning, you're teaching, you're, you're building your strength, you're building your health, you're building whatever it is around your world 
and it's regenerative. And so then it's then it is sustainable. It can it can go on because it's regenerative. Where if it's just sustaining, ultimately you're hanging on until you can't anymore. Yeah. And so I think that you know we we get wrapped up in the buzzwords. Um, sustainability was kind of the hot buzzword for a few years. Now it appears to be regenerative. Ultimately, it's what philosophy do you believe in? And really, regenerative agriculture in many ways is going back to the way our great grandparents farmed. A large farm was 100 acres because that's about all a family could manage. A third of it was in cover crops, a third of it was in pasture to feed the animals, and a third of it was to grow something to take to market, and you rotate it. Farmers rotate today, but it's rotated between corn, wheat, and soybeans. And where they had the soybeans last year, they put the corn. And where the corn was, then they put the wheat. And I'm not faulting those farmers that are growing commodity crops. We measure things for the wrong results. We measure for, for producing as many tons per acre as possible, keep the inputs as low as possible, and you might stay in business. And ultimately, they've done a very, very efficient job at working within the model that's, that exists. Costs low and produce as many tons per acre as possible. In the United States, as it relates to our income, we produce food cheaper than any other country in the world. As it relates to our income, our food is produced cheaper than any other um, country in the world. And what I mean by that is our disposable income, it takes less of our disposable income to buy our groceries. Now we can say, wait a minute, whole, you know, whole foods, whole check, there's that whole, but the reality is less of our paycheck goes to put groceries on the table than in any other. In some countries, 100% of their work is just to feed themselves. But here's the conundrum. We produce food cheaper than any other country in the world, yet we have the highest health care in the world. Yeah. There's a correlation with the way that we're growing for cheap food and our health or the lack thereof. From 1920 to 2020, we have a... 60 to 80 percent decline in the nutritional value of the vegetables google it take a look um it's not my numbers from 1920 to 2020 a 60 to 80 percent decline in the nutritional level of the vegetables and it's continuing to, to decline in that same time period 100 years from 1920 to 2020 a 3,000 percent increase in kidney liver heart cancer disease, attention deficit disorder, autism, childhood obesity, allergies, and diabetes. I would be willing to bet that anybody that's listening to this right now or anybody that will listen to it in the future has somebody in their immediate circle of friends or family that suffers from one or more of those diseases. That's not sustainable. That 100-year period to somebody young sounds like a long time. To guys like us, we're kind of getting on the other end of it. Uh, 100 years is not very long. And it's a crash course that has to change. Regenerative agriculture allows an opportunity for us to reposition and to start to look at this in a different way. We've got to preserve the soils. We've got to take care of the environment. But we've got to move the nutritional level of the vegetables. And we've got to do it without the chemical. And so there is hope. This isn't all doom and gloom. It doesn't, it doesn't take a long time. In about three years, you can start and turn this thing around. And the results that we're seeing from treating, working in harmony with nature rather than trying to outspart it, it's unbelievable. We're seeing, in some cases, nutritional increases of 150 to 300% higher than the USDA average. It's exciting. I feel it, Farmer Lee. Holy cow. Those numbers are staggering, both um, in a devastating way. Um, and also in a hopeful way, in a beautiful way. Are you seeing you, chefs come in? Uh, uh, do farmers ever call you? I assume they do and say, Farmer Lee, how are you doing it? Uh, like I, I, my hope is that what you're doing is a beacon of hope and inspiration for others to say, wait a minute, I saw your farming this way. I didn't think it could be done. Um, do you ever get to work with anyone else or do, are you seeing growth in terms of other farmers saying, yes, I want to be a part of this movement too? We are seeing it. Again, I'll go back to if you've got a system that's working, it's hard to make change. Yeah. You're, there's a there's a fear factor. Maybe they even know. Maybe it feels like it's not right. I mean, for years, we felt like it wasn't right. Think about it. Follow the money. Universities are financially strapped. Who's making the money? Pharmaceutical and chemical companies. They give grants to the universities to help the farmers. 
We want you to do research to help the farmers. By the way, we wanted to include the chemicals that we we produce yeah. to in the research to help the farmers. Um, and that's kind of a downward spiral. But yes, I think. But I think that it's more people that either financially are secure enough that they can take those risks, or they're back in a corner bad enough that they're saying, you know what, if we're gonna if we're gonna make it, we got to make some changes. Yeah. Um, so, you know, when you're back in a corner is when you're probably gonna get. Uh, how, what's what's that? Uh, there's an old saying about. Uh, Necessity is the mother of invention. Oh, well, yes. For and, sure. uh, you know, and of course, when we lost the farm, it was it was necessary for us to to uh, be creative. And so it's been an evolution. There's a great documentary right now. We're not part of it, but it's called Kiss the Ground. Hmm. And I would highly recommend anybody that's concerned about the sur survival of human society uh, to watch it. They predict that we have about 60 harvests left. And this movie was, was documented three years ago. So based on that, their prediction is we have 57 harvests left if we don't make some very serious changes. The wind erosion, we're losing the topsoil with to billions of pounds a year and the nutritional levels down, it's, uh, it's good stuff. We're also, we're part of one uh, called Food and Country with Ruth Rachel. It has not been sold yet. It's been airing some, but uh, they're just kind of putting it out, dribbling it out there, trying to get somebody to pick it up. But there's some good growers there uh, that are a part of that one as well. Ruth Rachel and a group of, of ladies decided during the middle of COVID that they needed to get the word out from a production standpoint. And they first started talking with chefs, but then they started talking to farms and they felt like it really, the voice needed to come from from the producer's standpoint rather than from the chefs and so they sp spent hundreds of hours documenting all the way through covid uh there'd be times in the middle of covid where i'm talking with ruth from new york and because we, they weren't coming out and doing a lot of filming and they they handpicked about six or eight folks and they had a few chefs involved in it as well i think it's a pretty good piece i can't wait to see it um those are great resources. Everyone check them out. We're going to, I think um, that sounds awesome. Let me ask you this before we get ready to wrap up here in a minute. Yeah. How do, I mean, you've got a, a book out. Uh, I think it's the chef's garden. Is that the book? Right. The chef's garden. Can people come visit? Do they visit the farm? How do people get to know you better and, and all that you're serving? I mean, there might be people watching at home right now and think, gosh, I want the sexiest vegetables on the planet. I would like to have those or the healthiest, most nutritious. How do people find you formerly? Well, you know, um, we've it's kind of evolved um, because we were just growing for high-end restaurants because that was a place where we could survive. Yep. Um, when COVID hit, those restaurants closed down and they were suffering. We pivoted to a nationwide home delivery, uh, literally in about a 24-hour period. A clunky website that was really an informational website converted to something where you could go on and and order delivered product from our farm to your home on the wow. back on your front porch in New York City or in Tampa or if you were doing okay it was funny how some people were doing okay in the covid and others were struggling um Rachel Ray would get on and order 100 boxes and send them to somebody that and she would do that about weekly so you can go to farmerjonesfarm.com and you can order a box of vegetables delivered to your home, or if you, you've got an Aunt Matilda in Tampa, and she has three of everything, and it's like, what? and you know you need to get her a gift. What do you get her? Get her a box, a subscription to a box of vegetables. But we kind of evolved. We, we believe that food shouldn't just be for fine dining, that it should be in it for anybody. Yeah. Um, and so we've tried to make the food more approachable for a broader market, and I think that the, the home delivery does that. Uh, we actually are so concerned that not only food needs to look good, taste good, but it should be good for us. And so the health and wellness has been a um, really a big push for us. We put a lab in right on the farm where we can test the nutrient, nutrient densities, see what's going on in the biology and the soil. We actually hired a doctor from the Mayo Clinic. We moved her 
and her family here from Minnesota, and she's on staff full time. Dr. Amy Sapola, she has a podcast that she does weekly, and you guys are welcome to to look her up and and watch her podcasts. But she comes to our farmers market, which we opened during the middle of COVID, to make the product available to the community, so folks can come to the farmers market. Jamie and Morgan came up with an idea to be able to take a spot that was only for chefs to come and visit as an Airbnb. So you can go to Airbnb and the Culinary Vegetable Institute. Uh, we have some folks that are that stayed here over the weekend that were from Steel Light. Uh, fella and his wife and, and I guess four-year-old son came and they got a farm experience. And uh, so that's, a, that's certainly available. If you're a chef, certainly we have opportunities for that. We do some corporate retreats. Um, uh, MLA will be here next week with a group of corporate chefs. Uh, Barilla's um, been out with corporate chefs. So, you know, we're, we're trying to make ourselves available. And, you know, one thing is for sure is that if we're, you know, if we're not willing to adapt and change, we die. And so yeah. COVID has pushed us kind of to keep shaking and moving and make ourselves available. We're grateful to all of the listeners and uh, everybody in the industry that's allowed our family at the chef's garden to be able to remain viable. It was a scary time. Yeah. Um, and you folks have allowed us the privilege of continuing to be a part of part of the story. So thank you. Formerly, you all have done an, an unbelievable job um, being creative in moments of challenge, um, finding ways to adapt and continue to serve and your gratitude. I feel your gratitude. And I love that that's the heart of so much of what you all are doing. And gosh, are you available to so many. Uh, I love ways we can connect with you, whether visiting or going out or buying veggies, et cetera. No, I'm going to get to my the last part of the show, which is my favorite. I, it's important. I feel your gratitude for so many in the industry who've supported your 187 families and your family and Jamie, so many people. And there's so many who are grateful for you. Um, I'm going to read you a couple encouraging words from some of your industry colleagues who are also friends and, um, and tell you just the difference you're making in so many lives. Tra Chef Travis, thank you, Farmer Lee Jones. Keep pushing, keep pushing, you know it. Thanks, um, Chef. Uh, Chef Bradley Kilgore. Lee is an even better person than he is a farmer. And since I consider him and the Lee family the best farmers on the planet, I think that describes how incredible him and the Lee family is. Their dedication to quality and chefs has set the bar at the highest level, and he keeps us all inspired. Hmm. Uh, this is someone you might know pretty well. Our friend, uh, Chef Jamie Simpson, who uh, you're yin and yang. The, yeah, you're uh, your partner in crime yeah. at the farm and at the CVI. Gosh, Jamie is a beautiful writer, by the way. He is. Close your eyes and picture a farmer. What do you see? For the last 10 years here, my picture has changed from black and white to full color. A good farmer cultivates more than fields and he drives more than the tractor you see. This farmer cultivates relationships and he drives positive change. He is enthusiastically affected an uncountable number of people's most precious moments through food. Somehow, he's a brother, a father, a best friend, and most importantly, a farmer. And all at once, wrapped with, all at once, wrapped in denim and topped with a red bow tie. Mm. Jamie, beautiful, buddy. John Clark, your friend from Disney. Yeah. I met Lee over a decade ago when I was a chef at Walt Disney World. When I first met Lee, I do not know what was more memorable, his red bow tie and overalls or his larger than life personality that makes you feel like you've known him for years. <laughs> Lee is a passionate individual, not only his product, but the success of those that utilize his produce. Lee is a farmer, a teacher, a cheerleader, and has one of the strongest moral compasses of anyone I have ever met. My life has been enriched through our professional contact, which has grown into a close and important friendship. Mm. Thanks, John, for sharing. Chef Todd Erickson, 
the private chef for Tony Robbins. From a aspiring chef at the Culinary Institute of America 22 years ago to cooking for the stars, I've been drawn to Farmer Lee's joy of life, of the earth, and the beautiful possibilities that grow from it. His kindness, his overalls, his red bow tie, his exceptional products and service have been a constant to our diverse, artistic, and wildly imaginative culinary community. I'm truly grateful to have met him. And all of my clients feel the love grown from his farm and from his heart. Wow, Todd. I saved, uh, it's certainly the best for last. This is your mom, Barb Jones. I might cry from early. Lee was born a year after we were married. When he was three days old, his dad had him on his lap on a tractor. Lee grew up hoeing weeds, driving a tractor at six, and helping out on the farm when he probably should have been playing baseball. <laughs> when we lost the farm to a hailstorm in the early 80s, Lee gave up his Ohio State University education, opting to take classes at a nearby community college so he could come back and help his dad. Lee and Bob worked shoulder to shoulder for the next 40 years to bring this farm back. Today, we're blessed to have Chef's Garden customers in every state and several countries. The chefs we service are more than customers. Many have become close friends over the years, visiting the farm and often becoming like family. We've expanded the, into home delivery and again, opened the local foam, uh, farm market, our answer to the COVID crisis, which closed restaurants. This helped us keep all our families who work with us and depend on the farm for their livelihood. We lost dad two years ago. Since, I've been able to count on a daily 8 a.m. call from Lee. Whether he's working with customers in Italy or in England or in his office at the farm, I know my phone will ring. Hey, mom, I'm just checking in. You need anything? What are you doing today? I am fortunate to call him my son. Farmer Lee, um, listen, man, you are a light to so many. And I know so many are a light to you. Your gratitude, we feel it. All your learning from so many, I think that's the gift, um, is that it's reciprocal for you. And uh, You guys aren't doing my eulogy tonight here, are you? <laughs> No, oh, no. Man. <laughs> no, wow. no eulogies. We're just, uh, it's important. You know, we don't hear it enough as people because um, it's not a question we ask. And and I wanted to make sure we've done this, I think, for every show. We've done over 100 shows. And this is a part of every one of them because it matters. You took time to, to come give us your journey, your story, your ups and your downs and how you push through moments of challenge. So everyone watching can learn that, you know what, they're capable of exactly the same. And um, everywhere you go, not only do you teach people wonderful things, but you'd let them know how much they mean to you. You give hugs and uh, just know that we're grateful for you. And thanks for all you continue to do. Thank you. Thank you so much. And for all the folks that uh, took the time to say such kind words i'm very very grateful and humbled so love you guys thank you we love you too chef uh, farmer lee everyone watching thanks for joining us uh so many notes from tonight go watch a good movie um look up regenerative farming you might ask yourself what does it look like to live a regenerative life uh, where i wake up in the morning excited passionate for what i'm doing your equivalent of waking up and feeding the farm or the, the horses and calling mom uh, go do that. Go be the best version of you, the most alive version of you that exists. And if you don't believe it, if you don't see it yet, know that it's there. Uh, Farmer Lee found it. Uh, Chef Jamie's living it. Um, so many in our community and we're in a wonderful industry to get to do that. Listen, uh, thank you for joining us. See you at Roots. Uh, we will see you at Roots. Someone's saying, see you at Roots. It's not coming up. There we go. Maybe that's Morgan or Jamie. Great to see you. Can't wait to be with everybody. Everyone have a wonderful night.